This episode is a repost of a show I recorded yesterday for the Lawfare podcast. As I mentioned on the show earlier this week, I'll be hosting a Zoom phone banking session for Biden from 5 to 7 Eastern on Saturday and Sunday. Google Calendar links are in the show notes. Hope to see you there. I think just Trump in general has different priorities. Like, he doesn't care about human rights anywhere, so why would he care about them in, in Xinjiang? I mean, I don't want to write off the U.S. government's actions entirely over the past few years with respect to this issue. There have been a number, an increasing number of uh, sanctions delegations. There have been a handful of smaller WROs. I mean, there are clearly people in the U.S. government right now who understand the awfulness of what's happening in Western China. But when you have a, a president who doesn't care and you know has has made it clear that he prioritizes other things be that be that trade or domestic politics over raising this as a, as an issue then it's by necessity going to end up being a, a one step forward two steps back sort of sort of strategy I'm Jacob Schultz and this is the Lawfare podcast October 28th 2020 There's a human rights crisis going on in the Chinese province of Xinjiang the Chinese government has been rounding up minority groups, most notably the Uyghurs, and putting them into forced labor and re-education camps. The government has gone to great lengths to keep Xinjiang away from international attention, and has had some success in doing so. Jordan Schneider, the host of Lawfare's China Talk podcast, wrote an essay on Lawfare last week outlining how the U.S. can respond and push back on the Chinese government's abuses in the region. During a live event for China Talk, I talked through Xinjiang and potential U.S. responses with Schneider and Sheena Greitens, an associate professor at UT Austin's LBJ School of Public Affairs. Schneider started off the conversation by asking Greitens about her work on Xinjiang before turning it over to me to ask him all about his proposal for U.S. response. It's the Lawfare Podcast, October 28th. What to do about Xinjiang. So, Sheena, what changed on the ground starting in spring of 2017? Yeah, it's a really great and troubling question. So we had seen, you know, the CCP had pursued for a long time in Xinjiang a process of state-led development, fairly heavy-handed repression, and an increasing turn toward assimilationist policy under Xi Jinping, which applied to not just to Xinjiang, but to minority policy more broadly. But what was really interesting was a turn, and, and troubling, like I said, is a, is a turn that CCP policy took in March of 2017. Toward the end of the preceding month, February, Chen Chuanguo, the party secretary in Xinjiang, who had been in Tibet before, came to Beijing for a meeting of the Central National Security Commission, party body that Xi Jinping had set up to deal with national security, which under Xi Jinping and in China refers to both foreign policy national security questions and domestic security, particularly things that impact the security of the CCP itself and the CCP leadership. And so the CNSC is, is a, a new body. It's only met a few times. One of the times it met was earlier this year to deal with the coronavirus pandemic and the impact that that could potentially have on, on social instability in China. And so the CNSC had a, a large symposium in Beijing. Chen Chuanguo goes to that meeting, comes back, immediately starts holding people's armed police and internal security policing rallies that honestly, in some cases, look like scenes out of Star Wars with a lot of mm. heavy equipment, black uniforms, people on the tarmac or in big parking lots in front of futuristic looking convention centers. And the, the orders go out in that month, March of 2017, to start rapidly building a set of detention facilities. And so ultimately, there are credible estimates from the UN and the US government that we have had somewhere between a million and a million and a half Uyghur, Turkic Muslim minorities in China and other religious and ethnic minorities to the point where the US Congressional Executive Commission on China called this the largest detention of a religious or ethnic minority that we know of in the world today. And it's really a shift between you know, sort of individually targeting people on the basis of behavior to targeting a group for who they are, for identity markers. So things that were normal religious practice suddenly could be used as evidence to put someone in a detention and re-education facility. And there they're subject to pretty intensive and coercive re-education to change their way of thinking. And in many cases, what that means is to eradicate some of the traditional markers of religious and ethnic identity and replace them with a sort of 
patriotism and nationalism that is a party led, a CCP led form of state based patriotism. I can talk a little bit more about, you know, what I think is going on there, but, but that's sure. basically the turn that things took in March of 2017. So there's a pretty hearty debate around what led to this policy. In this paper you wrote, you, you stand up some of the straw men, first the 2008 unrest and violence that, that happened across Xinjiang, a broader shift to a more assimilationist policy, as well as this jerk Chen Chuenguo showing up and deciding to uh, change the game. So what is missing about those three explanations, which doesn't entirely catch the dynamic of what led to the current situation? Yeah, I mean, great question. First of all, I think it's important to note all of those, I think, are necessary components of what happened. They just don't explain why exactly you get this hard right turn in 2017. So it's very clear that the CCP did pursue a more assimilationist, different type of of minority policy, right? We've seen that in Tibet, we've seen that recently in Inner Mongolia. So that's there. It's true that Chen Chuanghua moved from, from Tibet, but we often see, I think, people maybe carelessly using language like, well, he replicated what he did in Tibet. But we haven't actually seen the same kinds of, of camps. Um, we've seen some forced labor or labor transfers, which I, I know we're, we're going to talk about in a few minutes, and that's really important. But the CCP has always taken its approach to social control and adapted it to different locations, right? That goes back to the earliest, earliest days of party history, even before the PRC itself was founded. And so it, I think it's important to note that there is that tailoring to, to different ethnic groups. And, and then there's been regional contention. And it's true that after 2008, there was a large security buildup itself in Xinjiang, right? Massive recruitment drives to type, try to hire police, many of whom were hired outside the formal civil service system so that they could be hired cheaper and more flexibly. I've heard that story before. Construction of, construction of police facilities in China, convenience police stations that are a much more dispersed form of policing, the use of grid management, which is something that was developed in the urban east in like the mid-2000s to sort of organize and coordinate social control and delineate responsibilities for different problems more clearly. So all of that, you know, I want to be clear in the article when we talk about this, we're not saying that all of that stuff isn't important and that it doesn't play a role, but none of it on its own really kind of explains why at this one moment in 2017, we see a hard right turn in CCP policy and a shift to collective repression on a scale that's really, really unusual, right? Um, not just in Chinese history, but globally as well. So what you argue is that in specific ways in early 2017, as a preventative attempt to stop the transmission of perceived security threats across state borders into China, the CCP escalated repression. Leaders in Beijing and Urumqi concluded that a broad swath of Xinjiang's Muslim population was more vulnerable to jihadist infiltration than previously understood. Expand. <laughs> sure. What we see in 2017 is the CCP has been looking at the, what developments outside of China's borders. So she, Xi Jinping has a comprehensive national security policy that talks about the most complex national security environment China's ever had um, and talks about the fact that external and internal security are increasingly connected. And so what the CCP sees is that it's cracked down in the late 2000s has driven some Uyghur refugees, migrants, uh, people who've escaped, and of that number, a handful of them, a relatively small number, have made contact with Islamic militant groups in Southeast Asia or have gone and gotten involved in conflict in the Middle East, either with ISIS-aligned groups or groups that are affiliated with Al-Qaeda. And some of those groups have then made statements that they're going to train people to go back and wage jihad in China. And so our argument is that that development, which is really more in 2013 to 2016-ish, is part of what precipitated that escalation in repression. And that the CCP decides, you know, Xi Jinping has a doctrine of internal security that's very different even than sort of the traditional stability maintenance rhetoric that we used to hear about under Xi Jinping's predecessors. And I've written elsewhere that the phrase that I think encapsulates this new doctrine the best is this phrase prevent and control. And so what Xi Jinping is doing is basically saying, look, we have to prevent anything from coming back across our borders. The CCP has been worried for a long time about foreign destabilization or infiltration of China. We see that rhetoric on display in Hong Kong today. But in Xinjiang, the concern is that there's going to be reverse diffusion and that, that people are going to come back in, ideas, weapons are going to come back in and contribute to 
the capabilities and the motivation of some form of, of opposition, potentially violent opposition inside inside Xinjiang. Right. Um, it's important to note that, that this is an authoritarian system. They are not always right about their threat perceptions. And even if they were right that there's a serious terrorism issue, which a lot of experts don't think is correct, you know, then there's a question of is mass incarceration of a population who many of whom haven't done anything to deserve it, the right answer. And my and yeah. we think very clearly the answer is no, right? That the, the risk is actually very high, even if you take the CCP's goals as given that this is potentially really counterproductive. But the argument here is that the CCP was looking at these external developments and that, that heightened a sense of concern within China and that Xi Jinping has a different bar, right? This bar of prevention means that the stakes are very, very high and the state is willing to intervene much earlier. So the metaphor yeah. that the CCP uses is immunization, right? And, and again, immunization, it's preventive, but by definition, then you have to target a population, a whole population, not, we're probably all more familiar with these metaphors now, <laughs> with COVID, right? But you have to get a sort of a herd immunity phenomenon going. And what that means is that you, by definition, have to inoculate people who've shown no symptoms, no signs of concerning behavior. And so it is the whole framework of prevention, by definition, suggests that we have to target people who are, are innocent and who have not engaged in any radical activities or behavior. Yeah, lots of things to unpack. One point that I liked in your, in your piece is talking about how authoritarian regimes in general are just information poor. And the way the CCP is set up, this sort of thing is bound to be blown out of proportion, even though, you know, there are documented instances of Uyghur connected terrorist activities in China, thinking that that equals like the Islamic State showing up and like having the sort of splash that they've been able to have in the 2010s in the Middle East is far-fetched to the point of ridiculousness. But when you have a sort of more authoritarian country mindset and look at your issues through this information poor filter, then you, you end up blowing these things out of proportion. But I guess the other thing that struck out to me is thinking about how the U.S. responded, part of the psychology early after 9-11, which brought about the war on terror, of this being, you know, we can have no mistakes, we can have no errors. And then from that, you, you end up seeing some of the overreactions that the first two decades of the 21st century has contributed. And, and of course, this is not to say that the actions the U.S. government did in an overreaction to the war on terror were anything at the level of putting a million and a half people in concentration camps. But at the same time, the, the sort of bureaucratic momentum that can get behind fighting something that is almost impossible to have 100% inoculation from is a very tempting spiral to go down. Yeah, well, and I think what the CCP is doing is saying, okay, we can't control what happens, uh, you know, outside our borders, but we're going to try to, like I said, inoculate to prevent this virus from sort of taking root, even if it does manage to, to cross state borders. But like I said, the stakes of that are incredibly high, right? There's, there's almost nothing then that places any limit on what the state could do, which is a complete violation of standards of proportionality, let alone individual non-derogable or, or inalienable rights, as we're used to thinking of them under, under international law or the U.S. Constitution, right? So, so just a very, very different framework that does not bode well for China's Uyghur inhabitants or really anybody who, who potentially is seen as a, a challenge now or in the future to the party state, right? Um, I mean, that's the dangerous part is it's, it's inferring things that could happen in the future rather than being based on, on what's already happened. Um, I'll just say there's been, there has been um, some other writing. This isn't an area that I've looked at, but I did read and engage with some of the, the work on the effect of the war on terror. Sean Roberts has a, a new book out there are some people who've done some some really good work on this and i think you you hit at exactly you know sort of what the debate is here to to some extent the debate is can we take this you know as a, a serious security analysis on the part of the, the ccp you know there are very very smart well-informed people like jim millward and dahlia peterson have a, a paper that came out from brookings that, that says look this is an orwellian metaphor it's not a serious security analysis my take is actually that it's both. If you look at the documents released by ICIJ, if you look at what Xi Jinping said in internal speeches, it's really hard for us to believe because the, the level of objective threat seems so disproportionate to the response. But one of the things I learned from writing my first book 
was in some ways how paranoid and off of objective indicators, dictators' threat perceptions can actually be. So I don't think we can use the standard of what we see or what we think is reasonable to infer what the CCP does or doesn't take as a security threat. I, I think we have to acknowledge that their threat perceptions may be very different than what ours would be in that circumstance. Sure. So we're going to talk for the next half hour, 45 minutes about what the U.S. can do to sort of raise attention to this issue, as well as push back and make very clear to the Chinese government that this behavior is unacceptable. But is there any hope for this winding down anytime soon? You know, I think if somehow the CCP had a path where it could be genuinely convinced that it had succeeded, that might be possible. But again, I think recognizing the sort of fundamental and inherent insecurity that comes along with dictatorship and, and with non-democracy helps us to understand that, that this is going to be a perennial issue in China as we are coming to understand you know, the China of, of today. And the fact that this has been defined as a national security issue, that national security itself has become so central to Xi Jinping's rule and to his legacy, you know, my own sense is that the United States really needs to acknowledge how hard a problem we're dealing with here. And I think it's really important to pursue some of the measures, you know, that, that Jordan, that your paper outlined and some others like the ones that, that my colleagues at Brookings, um, Jim Millard and Dahlia Peterson wrote in their, their paper. But, you know, I think we I think we also need to be very realistic that something that gets to the core or the existence of Xi Jinping's regime is going to be very, very hard to move, right? The, another country I work a lot on is North Korea. And, I, you know, human rights and regime security have sort of similar connections there. There's a reason those are two of the hardest foreign policy challenges facing the United States today. Things that are existential to the fate of, of a regime become very, very hard to, to move. Now, that said, there's a lot the United States can do to lower our own complicity, make it harder, um, limit the damage, and even, you know, take positive steps to assist people who are suffering and who are victims, um, not just morally, but practically. Those are really, really important steps. And the United States need, I think, should pursue all of them. But I think it's, you know, we also need to acknowledge how, just how hard a problem this is, in part so that we can set realistic expectations for thinking about costs and trade-offs and kind of, you know, the time frame that we're thinking about here. Jordan, now we can talk about your your sort of plan for for peace and prosperity, your your road to success. So I want to start off with this sort of basic question. So if you were to listen to the Trump administration, the way they tell the story, no one is tougher on China than Trump. And you know, you'll have Secretary Pompeo giving these big speeches, sort of chastising Chinese military activity. You got Matt Pottinger giving angry speeches in Mandarin. But you contend, and sort of the, the basis of your piece is that the U.S. hasn't done anything coherent or anything significant on Xinjiang. Walk me through that. So how does Xinjiang fit into the administration's strategy to the extent that it has one for China? And do you have any guesses as to why it's sort of gotten the short shrift compared to other stuff? You don't need to guess. I think it was in Bolton's book where Trump said to Xi, this is fine. Seems like you're doing a good job there. And that's why you haven't seen the sort of, you know, really all in effort. And, and, and I think just Trump in general has different priorities. Like he doesn't care about human rights anywhere. So why would he care about them in, in Xinjiang? I mean, I don't want to write off the U.S. government's actions entirely over the past few years with respect to this issue. There have been a number, an increasing number of uh, sanctions delegations. There have been a handful of smaller WROs. I mean, there are clearly people in the U.S. government right now who understand the awfulness of what's happening in Western China. But when you have a, a president who doesn't care and, you know, has has made it clear that he prioritizes other things, be that be that trade or domestic politics over raising this as, a, as an issue, then it's by necessity going to end up being a, a one step forward, two steps back sort of sort of strategy. Yeah, so walk me through that a little bit more. Paint a picture of like what has the U.S. government done so far sure. on Xinjiang, whether it be Congress, whether it be different components of the administration. I guess one place to start would be you mentioned a WRO. So what is a WRO and how does it fit into this whole picture? And then you can go from there. All right, that one's deep. So let me let me do the easy ones, and then we'll and then we'll go off the deep end. So 
the U.S. government has been writing briefs and doing reports sort of warning the American as well as global business community about what's going on. So the State Department, July 1st, came out with like a long paper walking through you know the forced labor activities and kind of hinting that there would be more action down the road. The Treasury Department has put on an entity list a number of organizations. The XBCC, which is this sort of Bing Tuan, it's a hard thing to explain. It's sort of like a SOE that also has a military that runs 25% of the Xinjiang economy. That was a very large step. And there have been a number of, uh, I think, like 20 or 30 other companies or, or SOEs have been thrown onto this sanctions list. There also have been a handful of more narrow withhold release orders. So to come back to your question, withhold release orders are a tool that have been in Customs and Borders Patrol's back pocket since the 19th. 30s. However, there was a loophole which basically made it a relatively useless tool until legislation passed at the very end of the Obama administration. So now what the government can do is say that a certain product from a country or a company isn't allowed to enter the U.S. because it's suspected of being produced by forced labor. And until the company can prove otherwise, then you know, it'll be stopped at the border and, and sent back. So there have been a handful of smaller ones, like products from this factory or whatever have been banned. But the big one, which would be a ban on Xinjiang cotton, has not yet materialized. Right. So before we dive into like what your proposals are, I want to just flesh out one thing. So sure. she has mentioned that it's a bit of a tough nut to crack. The CCP isn't likely to be particularly flexible on the issue. So what do you see as a realistic goal for U.S. action as being? What should U.S. policymakers have in mind when trying to, to fix and, or to shape remedies? Should they be trying to incentivize private enterprise to behave in one way or another? What's the, what do you see as being the best target? So Sheena sort of hinted about it. I mean, clearly the overarching goal is to relieve human suffering because what's what's happening is awful and and the US as a country supposedly built on values is should care if there are a million and a half people who've been deprived of their freedom. So with that in the background, and also with the understanding of the past 20 minutes that Sheena explained, which is that a foreign government achieving that is going to be very hard, there are a few things that the U.S. should try to do. First is to take away any sort of complicity that America or our, our companies have in what's going on. And by that, I mean to make sure that no forced labor from these camps produces things that end up making money for U.S. companies or, or entering and are sold in America. Hopefully, also bringing that sort of mindset and, and spreading it to other countries who feel the same way about this issue and having it really turn into a global cause that, that makes clear to the Chinese government that what's happening is in, in Xinjiang is unacceptable. So, so in a sense, we, we have to cut out the complicity as well as raise this to a level of global conversation. There have been a number of times over the past few decades where human rights issues have really dominated the global discussion. We had that in Darfur in 2008. We had that in Myanmar for, for a brief moment. So it's not impossible. However, generally, this tends to happen when focusing on smaller countries where like the whole world can agree to pick on them. This is most certainly a bigger lift when calling out this issue means challenging the second largest economy in the world. But I think for the U.S. to sort of do the most it can to try to push the needle on this issue. It's going to be important to have an advocacy as well as a as well as a multinational component alongside the specific forced labor regulatory changes that we'll get into shortly. Yeah, if I could just maybe add to that for one moment, I think there's a couple of things going on here. One, I think the United States needs to be able to exercise global leadership on this issue. I think it would be very, very helpful. What's typically happened is a country like Germany has gone and presented a resolution at United Nations or Human Rights Council expressing grave concern about what's happened in Xinjiang. China comes back the next day or a few days later with an even larger number of countries, right? Okay, you got 45 countries. Well, we have 54 who say it's fine, right? So the United States needs to be able to have the ability to form coalitions in the international environment where we can agree on shared standards that do not include what's happening in Xinjiang. Right. Um, there should be some global baseline that is shared and clear. Um, the United States government, as a you know, major power in the international system, has a, a key role to play in whether or not that coalition and those standards are actually going to come into being in any meaningful sense. 
But I think the other point that, that Jordan raised is a really important one. And I'm reminded of some of the classes on sort of international normative theory that I took when I was in graduate school. And I think it was Henry Hsu at Oxford who made the point that part of the reason that we don't want torture is not just because torture is bad, right? Torture is bad, it is wrong, but it, from even a sort of self-interested moral standpoint, we don't want to be a society that affords the presence of torturers, right? So it, it's not just about sort of the effect on other people, it's also about this question of who we are and what standards we hold ourselves to and the members of our political community. And so I think it's really important to think about that when we think about Xinjiang, right? So this isn't, a, this isn't necessarily the torture case, but this is something that we should think about when we think about what standards do we wanna hold companies to, right? There's been this increasing push for corporate social responsibility, environmental sustainability, right? We're asking corporations to think about all sorts of, of ethical issues. Um, and I think it is entirely reasonable for us to pursue a strategy that has a multilateral diplomatic component, a US regulatory component. I think a US refugee and asylum component is really important here. And then also this sort of business ethics and supply chain piece of it, where we ask companies and we think about what kind of companies do we, do we want to be buying from and, and working with and, and how do we want them to think about their global responsibility. So, so I, you know, that's kind of how I'd put all that together, but it just to, just to second that piece that, that Jordan brought up about limiting complicity and why exactly I think that's, that's so important. I think that's a really valuable point. Yeah, so using that as a jumping off point, Jordan, I think maybe the way to break this down for listeners would be by sort of organ of government that you see as being the engine of change. So let's say I'm a Hill staffer and you want, you want me to convince my boss to, to do more about Xinjiang. So give me your pitch. What should Congress be doing to ramp up pressure on any one of the horizons that either you or Sheena mentioned? Sure. So Congress, the CBP has a mandate to enforce border controls and make sure that products containing forced labor do not enter the U.S. Right now, the sort of investigative body in charge of doing that has a $2 million budget, which equals basically no enforcement. So given that the estimated amount of, of forced labor products entering the U.S. is over $400 billion a year, we, we really should be able to put you know 50 or perhaps even $100 million into enforcing this mandate. Uh, second of all, if we do end up doing one of these more expansive withhold release orders like Xinjiang cotton or Xinjiang tomatoes or Xinjiang electronics full stop, then this will be far above the scale of anything that the Customs and Border Patrol has ever tried to enforce before. So, you know, previously it was like tobacco from Malawi or cotton from Turkestan, which is more straightforward than you would think because there are only like four or five companies that are coming out of Turkestan in the first place. So enforcing that sort of policy is going to require resources. The other thing that I think is going to require legislative change is, is beefing up the requirements that are put on companies to ensure that their products don't have force labor inside of them. So currently, the, the model is a shipment-based approach. So basically, what happens is CBP suspects that like some container on a boat is filled with a product that has forced labor inside of it. And then the company has to go and look into it and say, oh, no, look, we can trace this back and we can prove it isn't. Or if not, it gets, you know, it gets sent out or, or dumped. That is a pretty inefficient way of going about this. And particularly when you don't have a big enough stick of a large and impactful enforcement mechanism, you really don't end up getting the response that you're looking for, which is to have companies be putting in real effort to understand three, four, five levels down in their supply chain what's really going on. So in order to do that, I think a smarter way to go about encouraging companies to dive deep into the supply chains is have a controls-based system, which basically means that you set up a number of procedures that you want all companies to go through and you have some sort of government database that they're able to look into what these various companies are doing with regards to looking into their own supply chains. And then you can check the firms based on how rigorous their procedures are, as opposed to trying to catch it at the very last stage when it's you know mixed in with trillions of dollars of other imports that are coming into the, into the U.S. every year. All right. So, so that's one side of things. And then there's sort of actions that we need to take, that we need to emanate from within the executive branch. So walk us through some of those. 
what are the types of changes you'd like to see from different executive branch agencies to sort of to, to give a better, more more thorough response to all things Xinjiang? And maybe the place to start there is with sanctions. Sure. So the Treasury Department can accelerate the size and breadth of particular companies and, and Chinese organizations that have connections with Xinjiang. Right now, it's very much been companies that are you know, directly involved in running the factories, but there's definitely a sort of like secondary sanctions way of going about this where you start to target the companies that are facilitating those sorts of businesses. So thinking about making those companies who are working in the factories' lives harder if you're looking for a larger target set, using their business partners as potential, as potential sanctions victims, I guess, is another route to go. Yeah, so we'll move to the multilateral side of things in a second. But one last thing I'm, I'm curious and I'm getting your take on from the executive branch perspective or just from the U.S. government perspective in general would be asylum. So we had been, been talking with Sheena before recording about you know, asylum as an underutilized vehicle to, to sort of help make the situation better. Talk a little bit about that. I know, I know it's hard to come up with specific proposals, but what role do you see U.S. asylum policy is playing here? Sure. I mean, I think opening the U.S. borders to people who will be persecuted if they come back to China because of their uh, of their religion or their or their political beliefs is something that shouldn't really be up for debate. And the fact that this has gotten harder over the past few years over the Trump administration is a real travesty. And this is almost the easiest thing we can do, and perhaps even the most direct thing we can do to to help people who, if they come back to China, would end up being locked away for God knows how long. So it seems like a complete no brainer to me to make this sort of asylum process for, for Uyghurs as straightforward as possible. Yeah, so one of the things you talk a lot about in the piece is how the cornerstone of the U.S. response or sort of a necessary ingredient for an effective U.S. response would be on the diplomatic side, so sort of trying to get coalitions together to catalyze change in, in different international organizations. Flesh that out for me. What is what are the types of diplomatic moves that you see as being the most urgent from from a U.S. perspective, and, and maybe the most effective? Sure. So first off, we've been talking about the kind of congressional response of how to regulate borders and and do these controls on companies. I think pushing this sort of thing among parliaments all around the world is something that can really get momentum. You've had the UK modern slavery law of 2015. France passed a similar, actually even more aggressive law in 2017. And building off that momentum, as well as a number of EU parliamentarians speaking out specifically on the Xinjiang issue, I think is something that could sort of change the expectations that major democracies have of their companies in the way they deal with these sorts of supply chain issues for the better and presenting a united front to China that companies will not do business with firms that employ forced labor, only good things can come out of that, I believe. So coming to international organizations, it's hard, you know, many bodies China, of course, has a, has a veto on. So what's the likes of the UN General Assembly or, or Security Council or International Labor Organization could do is more along the lines of raising awareness and bringing this issue to the global forefront, as opposed to, you know, passing particular um, resolutions or anything binding that would, that would change the situation on the ground. So one of the ideas that I put forward in this paper was to bring the ILO to center stage. So the ILO is an interesting organization. It was actually founded after World War I and was one of the very few organizations that made it from the League of Nations era into the 21st century. And what it is, is a rotating collection of country representatives, as well as these company groups and labor groups around the world. And one of the things they do is try to have labor practices. So in the past, the ILO has sent experts to investigate particularly bad instances of labor rights violation. So what I'm proposing is for the U.S. or a U.S.-affiliated labor group or industry group to propose that the same sort of expedition be sent to China. Of course, China is unlikely to give them carte blanche in, in wandering around Western China and may very well not let them in entirely. But that in and it of itself is is a potentially galvanizing moment for the world to understand that China really does have something 
to hide. And in the past, these sorts of UN bodies, when writing reports like this, a lot of countries around the world sort of want that international organization, at least imprimatur, that something really is a global problem. And this is one of the ways that you can have a somewhat official commission come and say, this is something that we really cannot stand for as an international community that's committed to human rights. And so this may be a, a bit of an unanswerable question, but I wonder sort of after four years of Trump administration, diplomatic meanderings, how do you see this as working? So the administration had some diplomatic success vis-a-vis -vis China. The biggest example to me that comes to mind is sort of they've revived this quad alliance between India, Japan, Australia, and the United States. But does the U.S. have enough diplomatic credibility to have effectuate the types of changes that you you, you detail in the piece and I think would genuinely have to happen in order to get real international momentum going. So first off, in 2020, it's very clear that there is a lot of latent potential for various kind of international anti-China organizations or, or China response organizations to to come together and, and put pressure on China on various issues, whether that be military expansion or tech alliances or on human rights issues. So the fact that that you're even seeing these sorts of quad meetings after four years of Trump giving the finger to our allies of various shapes and forms in an absolutely unprecedented way just goes to show how concerned many uh, countries are around the world of China's rise and more importantly of, of Xi Jinping's regime. So taking that as a given, I think there is a lot of potential will there. And if Trump ends up winning in five days and has a change of heart on this issue, I actually do think that a fair amount of the international community would be there behind him. And Biden has mentioned this a handful of times that he s believes Xinjiang to be a, a serious problem. And he, of course, would have a much easier time wrangling allies in the world into making a united response on this. So I have two more questions for you about the, the sort of international pressure issue. So part of your argument in the piece is that however dismal we might think the prospects of actually getting the CCP to reverse course here are, there is one example of international pressure having a meaningful impact on China, and that's Darfur, which you had mentioned before. So, so China had been a supporter of the al-Bashir regime in, in Sudan, and then after lots and lots of international pressure, lots of hashtags save Darfur, they reverse course. But one of the ingredients that you described there as being necessary to getting that change to actually happen was a really high degree of celebrity and popular attention to the issue. Talk a little bit about yeah. what that looks like in terms of Xinjiang. Are there any real quorum of celebrities, athletes, high profile people of any sort who, who speak out on this issue? Or is it is there anyone who's a plausible vehicle to get this on more people's radars? Sure. So just coming back to the 2008 example, you know, you had Steven Spielberg talking about boycotting Beijing in 2008 and basically, you know, major A-list celebrities from Brad Pitt to George Clooney penning letters to the Chinese government saying you guys got to you guys got to change your policy on Darfur. It's completely unacceptable. Um, what we've seen with respect to, to Xinjiang, I think, is is a very different level of engagement. So the dynamic has been changing a little bit in the past month or so, where you've seen a handful of French Muslim celebrities from footballers to to rappers, to an actor, to publishing posts on their social media talking about what's going on in, in Xinjiang. Unfortunately, this is not, aside from Rudy Gobert, who himself is French, I think there's like Judd Apatow is the only other person who uh, listeners might have heard of who are sort of in the, in, the, in the Hollywood or sports ecosystem in the US who've said anything about this. And the reason is clear. In 2004, 2005, 2006, when the Chinese policy towards Sudan was most in the media, China had a very different role on the global stage than it does today. I'm sure most people are familiar with the kind of whole NBA Hong Kong arc of, of late 2019. And Daryl Morey, of course, the GM of the Houston Rockets, tweeted out something along the lines of supporting the Hong Kong protesters. And that 
caused a great international kerfuffle. You have LeBron James saying he really shouldn't have said that. And, you know, the discourse was really silenced within the NBA because the players understood that a lot of money was on the line by um, speaking up about this. So uh, at least as of now, the celebrities who've spoken up, most of them have had some sort of uh, personal connection, be that through religion or through being close to a Uyghur community in their country to lead them to, to, to take this step. And my hope is that even if sort of individuals at the moment may be a little too cowed by the potential blowback that such a step would cause, the government's getting it moving by doing things like passing major regulations, having heads of state give speeches, movement in international organizations like the ILO and the General Assembly. These sorts of things can maybe open the, the, the level of discourse and bring enough attention to this so that some of the celebrities who may be interested in speaking out on this, but it's not on their radar or they don't see it as important enough, may Maybe those cost benefit calculations will end up changing and you'll see more of a mass movement getting going, particularly around the Beijing 2022 Olympics, which could be a, a sort of rallying point as something that activism could point to. J'aime compter les petites coupures entre quatre de cours, j'ai vissé des copines. Au troisième étage, elle a du chou coupa. Le feu, je comprends que c'est négro copie. Y'a de la haine et des affaires, j'ai des infos qui peuvent te plaire. Il m'a dit, ouais, j'ai dit c'est qui, j'ai dit c'est quoi, il faut se le faire. Je me lève tôt parce que l'argent m'attire. J'en consommateur, je trouve qu'il fait tout faire. Ma chérie, moi j'ai rien à t'offrir. Mais comme je sais le faire, elle oublie les problèmes. Je te paye, ramène, ramène, ramène. Tout, achète, 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 achète. Je suis dans le hall, ouais. Là, je suis dans le hall, ouais. Je suis très peu de personnes me connaissent. Un homme me tient toujours ses promesses. Je suis dans le hall, ouais. Là, je suis dans le hall, ouais. Je suis très peu de personnes me connaissent. Un homme me tient toujours ses promesses. Elle fait du stroll, ouais. Elle fait du stroll, ouais. Il me compte me dire qu'elle est folle. Elle n'arrête pas de téléphoner. Très tôt la manière, un pour la plate, un pour le plat. La rue, c'est que je suis pas un imposteur. À midi en bas, j'étais posté. Regarde nos histoires. Les méchants sont fringués en costard. C'est pour ça que je voulais un costume. Mais la cagoule a fait que je pose. Sur rien à gratter, à gaffer et le pouce. Je suis dans le hall, ouais. Là, je suis dans le hall, ouais. Je suis très peu de personnes me connaissent. La rue n'apporte que des problèmes. Elle fait du stroll, ouais. Elle fait du schrot, ouais. Et mes potes me disent qu'elle est folle. Elle n'arrête pas de téléphoner. J'ai perdu le chemin de la maison, pose pas de questions. Ouais, j'ai ma caisse, t'as pourquoi La rue m'a fait tomber dans son char. Amoureux de l'odeur du pochta. Le col est infesté, obligé de rester. Dans la chambre, l'animal est trop bestial. J'ai la dalle, j'attends mon tour en passion. Habillé tout en a plaqué la poussière. Y'a un gris, rate les veines. Face à ceux qui portent les peines, elle ressemble un virage, elle vaut je freine. Adrénaline avant de monter en scène, me sens tu me fais saigner. Car alors comme ça, n'y a j'ai de la petite à la couleur du sapin. Il veut de la zip, je vois des chiffres. Produit maison, l'emballage est sous piste. Je regarde les tonnerres, l'argent m'a fait voir les bonnes. Je suis toujours dans la prière, mais le quartier me fait voir plus d'apôles. La nuit, je regarde les tonnerres, l'argent m'a fait voir les bonheurs. Toujours dans la prière, mais le quartier me fait voir plusieurs couleurs. Je suis dans le hall, je suis dans le hall. Un homme est toujours dans ce moment. Je suis dans le hall, je suis dans le hall. Un homme est toujours dans ce moment. Plus d'un million de personnes seraient actuellement détenues dans ces camps, et voici l'une des rares vidéos de cette réalité. Des centaines d'hommes issus de cette minorité musulmane, menottés, le crâne rasé, juste avant leur transfert en train vers des camps de détention. 